Part Two, Chapter Fifteen, of the Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Lars Rolander. Part Two. THE WOMAN IN THE CASE CHAPTER Fifteen, RETRIBUTION His brain seemed to whirl, staggered as by some gigantic, ghastly mockery. The crime club! Here! He had thought to creep upon that man, and he had run blindly into the very heart and centre of this hell-fiend's nest. Silently he stood there, holding his breath as he listened now motionless as a statue, forcing his mind to think. He remembered that last night his impression of the place had been that it was more like some great private mansion than anything else. Well, he had been right, it seemed. He could have laughed aloud, sardonically, hysterically. It was not so strange now that there were no rooms on the right-hand side of the corridor. And what could have suited their purpose better? What, by its very location, its unimpeachable character, could be a more idle lair for them than this house? And how grimly simple it was now, the explanation. In the five years that the false Henry LaSalle had been in possession, they had cunningly remodeled the upper floor. That was all. It was quite clear now why the man never entertained why he had never been caught or found or known to be in communication with his fellow conspirators. It was no longer curious that one might watch the door of the house for months at a stretch and go unrewarded for one's pains, as the tocsin had done, when access to the house by those who frequented it was so easy through the garage on the side street, and from the garage, if their work there was in keeping with their clever contrivances within the house, by an underground connection into, say, the cellar or basement. Again Jimmy Dale checked that nervous, unnatural inclination to laugh aloud. Was there anything, any single incident, any single detail of all that had transpired, that was not explained, borne out as it could be explained and borne out in no other way, save that the crime club should be no other than this very house itself. It was the exposition of that favorite theory of his. It was so obvious that therein lay its security. He had mocked at the magpie not many moments before on that score, and now it was the beam in his own eye. It was so obvious now, so glaringly obvious, that the crime club could have been nowhere else, so obvious, with every word of the tocsin's story pointing it out like a signpost, and he had not seen it. And then suddenly every muscle grew strained and rigid. Was there someone in the corridor? Was it someone moving, or was it only a fancy? He listened, while he strained his eyes through the darkness. There was no sound, only that abnormal, heavy silence that, yes, he remembered that, too, now, that had clung about him last night like a pall. He could see nothing, hear nothing, but intuitively, bringing a cold dismay, the greater because it was something unknown, intangible, he felt as though eyes were upon him, that even in the darkness he was being watched. And as he stood there, then slowly there crept upon Jimmy Dale the sense of peril and disaster. It was not intuition now. It was certainty. He was trapped. It was the part of a fool to imagine that with their devil's cunning, their cleverness, their ingenuity, he or anyone else could enter that house unknown to its occupants. Had he made electric contact when he had opened the front door, and rung a signal here, perhaps upstairs? Had he set some system of alarm at work when he had touched that window? What did it matter, the details that had heralded 
his entrance? He was certain now that his presence in the house was known. Only, why had they left him so long without attack? He shook his head with a quick, impatient movement. That, too, was obvious. He was under observation. Who was he? Why had he come? Was he simply a paltry safe-tapper, or was he one whom they had a real need to fear? And then, too, there might well be another reason. It was far from likely, in fact unreasonable, to imagine that all the men he had seen here the night before were in the house now. Not many of them, if any, would live here for constant. Daily coming and going, even through the garage, could not escape notice and of the servants, probably a lesser breed of criminal, some of them at least, no doubt, were engaged at that moment in watching his own house on Riverside Drive. There was even the possibility that the man posing as Henry LaSalle was, for the time being, here alone. He shook his head again. He could hardly hope for that. He had no right to hope for anything more now than a struggle with an inevitable fatal ending to himself, but one in which at least he could sell his life as dearly as possible, one in which, perhaps, he might pay the toxin score with the man he had come to find. If he could do that, well, after all, the price was not too great. There were no tremors of the muscles now. It was Jimmy Dale, the Grey Seal, every faculty alert, tense, keyed up to its highest efficiency, the brain cool, keen, and active, fighting for his life. The front door through which he had entered was an impossibility, but there was the window in the library that he had opened, if they would let him get that far. That was as good a chance as any. If he made an effort to find, say, a way to the flat above, and chance some means of escape there, it would in no wise obviate an attack upon him, and he would only be under the added disadvantage of unfamiliar surroundings. Feeling out with his left hand, his automatic thrown a little forward in his right, he began to retrace his way along the blank wall of the corridor, pausing between each step to listen, moving silently, his tread on the heavy carpet as noiseless as though it were some shadow creeping there. Stillness, utter, absolute, always that stillness, always that sense of danger around him, the tense, baited expectancy of momentary attack, a revolver flash through the darkness, a sudden rush upon him, but still there was nothing, only the darkness, only the silence. He gained the head of the stairs and began to descend, and now the strain began to tell upon his nerves again. Again he was possessed of the mad impulse to cry out, to do anything that would force the issue, that would end the horrible, unbearable suspense. Why did that revolver shot not come? Why had they not yet rushed upon him? Why were they playing with him as a cat with a mouse? Or was it all wild, fanciful imagination? No. What was that again? He could have sworn this time that he had heard a sound, but he could neither define its character nor locate the direction from which it had come. He was at the foot of the stairs now, and, guiding himself by the wall, moving now barely an inch at a time, he reached the library door that he had left open, and stole in over the threshold. Halfway down the room, and diagonally across from where he stood, was the window. In a moment now he could gain that, but they would never let him go so easily. And so it must come now, in that next moment, their attack. Where were they? Where were they now? The table. He must remember not to bump into the table. A pause between each step. He was crossing the room. He was halfway to the window. Had it been all fancy? Was he, too? And then Jimmie Dale stood motionless. Someone had closed the library door softly. 
stillness again. A sort of deadly calm upon him. Jimmy Dale felt out behind his back for the big library table that he had been circuiting. If the window were wide open, it might be done. But to jump for it and stand silhouetted there during the pause necessary to fling the window up was little less than suicidal. He edged back noiselessly until his fingers touched the table. Then, lowering himself to his knees, he backed in underneath it and lay flat upon the floor. It was not much protection, but it had one advantage. If they switched on the lights, it would show an empty room for the first instant, and that instant meant the first shot. Where were they now? By the library door? How many of them were there? Well, it was their move. Two could play a cat and mouse until, until daylight. That wasn't very far off now, and when that came he might still have the first shot. But after that, he turned his head quickly toward the window. There was a faint scratching noise as of fingernails gripping the sill. Then the window, very slowly, almost silently, was pushed steadily upward and a dark form loomed up outside, and then, crawling through, a man dropped as though his feet were padded like a cat's on the floor inside the room. The magpie! A flashlight's ray shot out, and with a twisted smile propped now on his left elbow to give free play to his revolver arm, Jimmy Dale followed the white spot eagerly with his eyes. But it did not circle around, Instead, the light was turned almost instantly toward the lower end of the room, and a second later was holding steadily on the open door of the safe and the litter of papers on the floor. Came a savage growl of amazed fury from the magpie. Then he stepped down the room, and as he reached the safe, a torrent of unbridled blasphemy and then, in a sort of a staggered gasp, as he leaned suddenly forward, examining the knob of the dial. The grey seal! A moment the magpie stood there, and then, cursing again in abandon, turned and started back for the window, his flashlight dancing before him, and stopped a snarl of fury on his lips. The flashlight was playing full on Jimmy Dale under the table. Larry the Bat! the gray seal by god choked the magpie you you the magpie's flashlight as he shifted it from his right hand to his left and wrenched out his revolver had fallen upon two men crouched close against the wall by the library door and he screamed out in an access of fury de double cross a plant de balls you damned snitch larry screamed out the magpie and fired the bullet tore into the carpet beside Jimmy Dale, came answering shots from the men by the door, and then the magpie emptying his automatic at the two men as he ran, the flame tongues cutting vicious lanes of fire through the darkness, dashed for the window. There was a cry, the crash of a heavy body pitching to the floor, and the magpie had flung himself out through the window, and in the momentary ensuing silence within the room came the sound of his footsteps running on the gravel below there was a low moan the movement as of someone staggering and lurching around and then the lights went on but for an instant jimmy dale did not move he was staring at the form of a man still and motionless on the floor in front of him the man who had posed as henry lasalle dead the man was dead his mind ran riot for a moment. Where were the others? Were there only these two? Only these two in the house. Only these two. And one was dead. And then Jimmy Dale was on his feet. One was dead, but there was still the other, the man who was reeling there, back turned to him by the electric light switch. But even as Jimmy Dale sprang forward, this second man, clawing at the wall for support, slipped to his knees and fell upon the carpet. Jimmy Dale reached him, snatched the revolver from his hand, and bent over him. It was the man whose name he did not know, but whose face he had reason enough to know too well. It was the leader of the crime club. 
The man, though evidently badly wounded, smiled defiantly in spite of his pain. So you're the Gray Seal, he flung out contemptuously. A clever enough safe cracker, but only a low brow, like the rest of them. Another illusion dispelled. Well, you got the money. Better run, hadn't you? Jimmy Dale made no answer. Satisfied that the man was too badly hurt to move, he went and bent over the silent form in the centre of the room. A moment's examination was enough. Henry LaSalle was dead. He stood there looking down at the man. It was what he had come for, though it was the magpie, not himself, who had accomplished it. The man was dead. The words began to run through his mind in a queer reiteration. The man was dead. The man was dead. He checked himself sharply. He must think now, think fast, and think right. The magpie knew that Larry the Bat was the Gray Seal, and as fast as the magpie could get there, the news would spread like wildfire through the underworld. Death to the Gray Seal! Death to the Gray Seal! He could hear that slogan ringing again in his ears, but as he had never heard it before, with a snarl of triumph now, as of wolves who had at last pulled their quarry down. He had not a second to spare, and yet that man wounded there on the floor. What of him? Guilty of murder, the brains of this inhuman, monstrous organization, the one to whom, more even than to that dead man, the tocsin owed the horror and the misery and the grief and despair that had come into her life. What of him? What of the crime club here? What of this nest of vipers? Were they to escape? Were they to— With a sudden low exclamation, Jimmy Dale jumped for the table, and snatching up the telephone, rattled the hook violently. Give me! His voice came in well-simulated gasps, each like a man fighting for every word. Give me! Police! Headquarters! Quick! Quick! I'm— been shot the wounded man on the floor raised himself on his elbow what are you doing he demanded in a startled way are you mad thank your stars you were lucky enough to get out of this alive and get out now while you have the chance jimmie dale pressed his hand firmly over the mouthpiece of the telephone i'll go he said with a cold smile when i've settled with you for the murder of henry lasalle that man ejaculated the man scornfully pointing to the form on the floor so that's your game going to try and cover your tracks why you fool i live here do you think the police would imagine for an instant that i killed him i said henry lasalle said jimmy dale evenly the man came farther up on his elbow a sudden look of fear in his face what what do you mean he cried hoarsely, but Jimmy Dale was talking again into the telephone, gasping, choking out his words as before. Police headquarters. I'm Henry LaSalle, Fifth Avenue. I, I've been shot. Take down this statement. I'll, I'll be dead before you get here. I'm not the real Henry LaSalle at all. We murdered Henry LaSalle in Australia and murdered peter lasalle here we we tried to kill the daughter but she ran away this house has been our headquarters for the last five years the man who shot me tonight is the leader of the gang we quarrelled over the division of a hall he's here on the floor now wounded get them all get them all damn them do you hear get them all they're out of the house now but lay a trap for them they always come in through the garage on the side street oh oh god i'm done for break down the west walls of the rooms upstairs if you want proof of what the gang has been doing hurry hurry i'm i'm done for i Jimmy Dale permitted the telephone to drop with a clash from his hand to the table. The face of the man on the floor was livid. 
"Who are you? In God's name, who are you?" he cried out wildly. "Does it matter?" inquired Jimmie Dale grimly. "Your game is up. You'll go to the chair for the murder of Henry LaSalle if it is by proxy. Those rooms upstairs alone are enough to damn you, to prove every word of that dying confession. But to morrow, added to it, will come the story of Marie LaSalle herself." For a moment the man hung there swaying on his elbow, his face working in ghastly fashion, and then, suddenly, with a strange laugh, he carried one hand swiftly to his mouth and laughed again, and before Jimmie Dale could reach him was lifeless on the floor. A tiny vial rolled away upon the carpet. Jimmie Dale picked it up. A drop or two of liquid still remained in it, colorless, clear, like that liquid this same man had dropped into the rabbit's mouth the night before, like the liquid in the glasses they had carried into that third room, like the liquid that this man had said was from a formula of their own, that was instantaneous in its action, that defied detection by autopsy. The set, stern features of Jimmy Dale relaxed. It was justice, but it was also death. In a search of emotion, the events of scarcely more than twenty-four hours began to crowd upon him, and then, ominously dominant, above all else, that slogan of the underworld, Death to the Grey Seal, came ringing once more in his ears. It brought him, with a startled movement of his hand across his eyes, to a realization of his own desperate position. Yes, yes, he must go. The way was clear now for the tocsin, clear now for her. He dropped the vial into his pocket, and, running to the safe, quickly scraped the grey seal from the dial's knob. Then he drew the packages of money from his shirt and pockets, and tossed them on the floor among the litter of papers already there. She would get it back again when it had served its purpose. It would be self-evident that it was the proceeds of that day's sale of the estate securities over which the quarrel had occurred. And now the window. He ran to it, closed it, and locked it. Then, laying the revolver he had taken from the leader down beside the man, he stepped across the room again, and drew the body of Henry LaSalle closer to the table, as though the man had fallen there when the telephone had dropped from his hand. It was done now. On the floor beside him lay each man's weapon, and both of the revolvers had been discharged several times. Jimmy Dale paused on the library threshold for a final survey of the room. It was done. The way was clear for her. And now, if he could only save himself, there was no chance for Larry the Bat. Could he save Jimmy Dale? He crossed the hall, a queer, half grim, half wistful smile on his lips, unlocked the front door, stepped out, locked it behind him, and in another moment, doubling round the corner, was running along like a hare along the side street. End of Part 2 Chapter 15 Of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Read by Lars Rolander Part Two, Chapter Sixteen, of the Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard, reading by Lars Rolander. Part Two, The Woman in the Case Chapter 16 Death to the Grey Seal On Jimmy Dale ran. Across on Fourth Avenue he swung on a car that took him to Astor Place. Then, striking east once more, making a detour to avoid the Bowery, he ran on at top speed again. To reach the sanctuary, not before the magpie should have spread the alarm, that was impossible, but to reach it before the underworld should have had time to recover its breath, as it were, 
before the underworld should have had time to act. That was his only chance. The magpie had, at the outside, a start of fifteen minutes, but he, Jimmy Dale, had probably retrieved five minutes of that in the time he had made in getting downtown. That left the magpie ten to the good. How long would it take the magpie to bring the underworld swarming like hornets around the sanctuary? On Larry the bat ran. At the sanctuary were the clothes, the belongings of Jimmy Dale. Could he save Jimmy Dale? If he could get there, changed, and get out again, the way was clear for him. As clear as for the tocsin now. In a few hours the police would have every member of the crime club in the trap. There would be no watch any more around his house on Riverside Drive, and he would be free to return there and resume his normal life as Jimmy Dale again, if he could make the sanctuary in time. But let the magpie get there first. Let the underworld tear the place to pieces in its fury as it would do. Let them discover that hiding place under the flooring, for instance, and the grey seal would not be merely Larry the Bat, but Jimmy Dale as well, and a cry escaped him even as he ran. It meant ruin, the disgrace of an honoured name, death, crimes without number at his door, crimes. The grey seal had never committed a crime, but the crimes attributed to the grey seal he could not disprove, not one of them. He had meant them to appear as crimes, and he had succeeded so well that the Grey Seal's name, execrated, was a synonym for the most callous, dangerous, and unscrupulous criminal of the age. He was gasping for breath as finally, making for the side door, he darted into the alleyway that flanked the sanctuary. What story would the magpie tell? Not the truth, of course. That would let the magpie in for what had happened that night, for the magpie must be well aware that he had shot at least one of the two men in that room. But the truth wasn't necessary. It was foreign and had no bearing on the one outstanding fact. The grey seal was Larry the Bat. At the present moment the magpie had a double incentive for getting the grey seal. The Grey Seal was the only one who could prove murder against him that night in the La Salle mansion, and afterwards, when the police version of the affair was made public, the magpie, to save himself, would be careful enough to do or say nothing to contradict Henry La Salle's confession. Larry the Bat slipped in through the door, halted there, listened, and then began to mount the rickety stairs with his silent tread. At the top he paused again. Nothing. No sound. They were not here yet. So far he was in time. He stepped to the sanctuary door, unlocked it, passed into the squalid, miserable room that had harbored him for so long as Larry the Bat, locked the door behind him, crossed quickly to the window to make sure that the shutters were closed. And then, for the first time, as the gray light streaked in through the interstices, he was conscious that it was already dawn. So much the more need for haste, then. He whipped out his revolver and laid it at his hand on the dilapidated table. Then the flooring in the corner was up in an instant, and he began to strip off the rags of Larry the Bat. Boots, mismated socks, the torn, patched trousers, the greasy flannel shirt, the threadbare coat, the nondescript slouch hat were thrown in a pile on the floor, and with them, from their hiding place, the grease paints and heterogeneous collection of make-up accessories. This done, he began to slip on the clothes of Jimmy Dale, and when half-dressed, turned to the table again to remove the characteristic grime, stain, and paint to Larry the Bat from face, hands, wrists, throat, and neck. This was a longer, more arduous task. He reached for the cracked pitcher to pour more water into the basin, and, snatching up his revolver instead, whirled to face the door. Someone was outside. He had caught the creak of a footstep upon the stairs. In a flash he was across the room and crouched by the door. Yes, the step was nearer now. At the head of the stairs, on the landing, 
his revolver lifted, holding a steady bead on the door panel. And then there came a low voice. Jimmy! Jimmy! Are you there? Quick, Jimmy! Are you there? The Toxan! What was she doing here? Why had he not warned her up there on the avenue? Fool that he was, that of, that of all places she was to keep away from here. She slipped into the room as he unlocked the door. They're coming, Jimmy, she panted breathlessly. There's not an instant to lose. Listen, when the magpie ran from the house, I ran with him, but it— She tried to smile. It wasn't to obey you to run away. I had made up my mind. I wouldn't do that. It was to find out from him what had happened. He told me you were the Grey Seal. He did not suspect me. He thinks you were no more than just Larry the Bat to me, as you were to everybody else. He went straight to Chicago Ike's gambling rooms and found the Skeeter's gang there. You know them. Red Mose, the Midget, Harv Toms, and the Skeeter. You remember your fight with them over old Luddy's diamonds? Well, they have not forgotten either. They are on their way here now. The news that you are the Grey Seal is travelling like lightning all through the underworld. There will be a mob here on the Skeeter's heels. So, Jimmy, quick, run! Run, half Larry the Bat, half Jimmy Dale, and run! In another five minutes, perhaps, yes, but there probably would not be five minutes. And she, if she were found here. Yes, he said quietly, I'll get away in a moment. You go at once. I'll, he was smiling at her reassuringly, I'll meet you at, she looked at him then for an instant, interrupting him quickly as she shook her head. I didn't notice, Jimmy. You cannot go like that, can you? It would be even worse than being caught as Larry the Bat. Hurry then. I'm not going without you. No, he said. Go now. Go at once, Marie. While you can. You have risked your life as it is to come here and tell me this. For God's sake, go now! The great brown eyes were smiling bravely through a sudden mist. She shook her head again. Not without you, Jimmy. It brought a fierce, wild throb of joy upon him, and then a cold, sickening fear. Listen! he cried out desperately. You must go now. You cannot take any chances now, Marie. Everything is right for you. That man who posed as your uncle is dead. The leader of the crime club is dead. Don't you understand what that means? You have only to be Marie LaSalle again and claim your own. I cannot tell you all now. There is no time. That house was the crime club itself. The police will get them all. Don't you see? Don't you see? Everything is clear for you now. And now go, go, you must go. She was staring at him, a strange wonder in her face. Clear? All clear for me? I, I can go back to, to my own life again? It was as though she were whispering some amazing thing of unbelievable joy to herself. Yes, he cried out again. Yes, but go, go, Marie. But now for answer. Suddenly she reached out and took the key from the door and put it in the pocket of her dress. We will go together, Jimmy, or not at all, she said simply. We are wasting precious moments. Hurry and dress. He hesitated miserably. What could he do if she would not go? And it was true. The moments were flying. Better rather than futile argument to use them as she said. There was still a chance. Why not? Five minutes. He could do better than that. He must do better than that. Without a word, he ran back across the room. In frantic haste, from face, hands, wrists, and neck came the stain. There was still time. She was standing there by the door, listening. She, the Toxan. She, whom he loved. She, who all through the years that had gone had been so strangely elusive and yet so intimately a part of his life. She was standing there now, here with him, in peril, with every second that passed. He had only to slip on his coat and vest now, and make a bundle of Larry the Bat's things on the floor, so that he could carry them away to destroy them. 
he stooped to gather up the clothes and straightened suddenly and jumped toward the door again they're coming jimmy she called in a low voice but he had already heard them the stairs were creaking loudly under the tread of many feet he pushed the tocsin hurriedly back against the wall at the side of the door stand here he said under his breath out of the line of fire don't move there was a rush against the door and then a voice growled ow oh, cut that out what do you want to do scare him away by bustin it pick the lock and we'll lay for him inside till he shows up it was the skeeter's voice the skeeter and his gang the worst apaches in the city of new york professional assassins death contractors he had called them and the lowest bidders a man's life any time for twenty-five dollars no they were not likely to forget the affair of the pushcart man to forget old luddy and his diamonds to forget the gray seal and they were only the vanguard of what was to come someone was working at the lock now there was one way to stop that it would not take them long to find out that he was here once the door was open. Better know it with the door shut. Jimmy Dale lifted his revolver coolly and fired through the panel. A burst of yells answered the shot, and among them high above the others the magpie screamed, We got him! We got him! He's there now! And then it seemed that pandemonium broke loose. There was a volley of shots, the bullets splintering through the door panels as from a machine gun. So fast they came, and then another rush against the door. Flat on the floor, but well back on to one side, Jimmy Dale fired steadily again and again. Came screams of pain, yells and oaths, and they fell back from the door. And now from above, from overhead, came tumult, windows thrown up, the stamp of feet, cries of fright and from the street a low, sullen roar. The underworld was gathering fast. Once more the rush upon the door, and Jimmy Dale, a grim, twisted smile upon his lips, emptied his revolver into the panels. Once more they fell back, and then there came the skeeter's voice, snarling like an infuriated beast. He'll get a lot of us like this. Cut it out. Besides, we'll have the bulls down here in a minute. And he's our meat, not theirs. They'd be too damned soft with him. They'd only send him to the chair. Use Chase upstairs, Mose, and pass the word to him eat it. And beat it quick. We'll burn the skunk out, that's what. And the bulls can stand alongside the watch if they likes. But he's our meat. Jimmy Dale did not dare to look at the tocsin's face. Mechanically he refolded the magazine of his automatic and lay there waiting. The roar from the street grew louder. They seemed to be fighting out there, as though an inadequate number of police were trying to disperse a mob and not succeeding. Pretty soon, with the riot call in, there would probably be a battle for the Grey Seal. Sublime irony. It was death at the hands of either one. Children whimpered on the stairs outside. Men swore. Women cried, feet shuffled hurriedly by as the tenement emptied. Occasionally, a pertinent invitation to him to remain where he was. There was a vicious rip through the panel, and the drumming were of a bullet flying through the room. And then a curious, ominous crackling sound, and then the smell of smoke. Jimmy Dale stood up, his face drawn and haggard. The tenement would go like matchwood, burn like bonfire, with any kind of a start, and there was no doubt about the start. The skeeter, the magpie, and the rest would have seen that it had headway enough to serve their purpose before either firemen or police could thwart them. He, Jimmy Dale, could take his choice, walk out into the bullet, or stay there and he smiled miserably as his eyes fell upon the pile of larry the bat's clothing on the floor there was no longer need to worry about its destruction the fire would take care of that only too well and then a low bitter cry came to his lips and he clenched his hands if it were only himself only himself he crossed to the tocsin 
and caught her in his arms. "'Oh, my God, Marie!' he faltered. The cape and hood had fallen from her, and with the hood had fallen the grey streaked hair of Silver Mag, and now, as she smiled at him, it was from a face that was very beautiful and very brave and very full of tenderness. And he held her there, and neither spoke. It seeped in under the threshold of the door. It came from everywhere, filling the room, the black strangling smoke. Outside in the hall all was silence now, save for that crackle of flame that grew in volume, that came now in quick, sharp reports like revolver shots. From out in the street swelled a cry, Death to the Grey Seal! Then the clang of bells, the roar and rattle of fire apparatus, strident voices, bellowing orders, and the crowd again, blood-hungry. Death to the Grey Seal! There was a chance, just one, if the fire had no headway along the upper end of the landing, and if they had not thought to set a watch for him above, they, the magpie, the skeeter and his gang, must have been driven even out of the house now by the smoke and flame. "'Give me the key. I'm going to open the door, Marie,' he said quietly. "'Cover your face with a handkerchief, anything, and run to the left, to the next flight of stairs. There are two flats above this. We'll make the roof if we can. Now, are you ready?' It was an instant before she answered, an instant in which she lifted her face to his, and held his face between her two hands, and then, I am ready, Jimmy. He flung open the door, his arms around her to help her forward, and instinctively, with a cry, fell back for a moment. With the inrush of the draught poured the smoke, and through it, lurid yellow showed the flames leaping from the stairwell. And then all was blind madness. Together they ran. At the foot of the stairs she fell, recovered herself, staggered up another, and fell again. He caught her up in his arms, and, staggering now as she had staggered, went on. His lungs seemed to be bursting. His limbs grew weak and trembled under him. He could not see or breathe. The nauseating fumes suffocated him, bringing an intolerable agony. He gained the first landing above. There was one more, one more. If he could only rest here for a moment. Yes, that was it. Rest. It wasn't so bad here now. She stirred in his arms, struggled to her feet, and he was helping her on again, and up the next flight of stairs. And suddenly he found himself laughing in hysteria, for they were climbing a half-stair, half ladder half away at the end of the upper landing, and the open skylight was above them, and they were drinking in the pure, fresh air and now they were out upon the roof, and the roar from the street was in their ears, like the roar of great waters from some canyon far below. Jimmy Dale tried to speak, and found his lips were cracked and dry. He wet them with his tongue. "'Don't stand up. We'd be seen. Crawl!' he mumbled hoarsely. It took a long time, over one roof, and then another, and yet another— and then through the skylight of a tenement whose occupants were either craning from the front windows or were on the street below. It was perhaps half an hour, and then they, too, were standing in the street, and all about them the crowd was shouting in wild excitement. Up the block inside the fire lines the sanctuary was blazing furiously, and now suddenly the wall seemed to bulge outward. It brought a yell from the crowd, Death to the Grey Seal! She pulled at his arm. Let us get away. Let us get away, Jimmy, she whispered frantically. A strange smile was on Jimmy Dale's lips. We're safe now, for always, he whispered back. Look! The sanctuary wall bulged farther outward, seemed to hang an instant, hesitant in mid-air, and fell with a mighty crash. The Grey Seal was dead. End of Part 2 Chapter 16 And End of the Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard Read by Lars Rolander